Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes. Eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tolohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Tribes are leading the way in COVID-19 vaccines, with many nearly fully vaccinated. In Iowa, the Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi says 70% of its eligible population are fully vaccinated, which is nearing herd immunity. The report in the Washington Post also shows that in Arizona, the Navajo Nation is also about 70% fully vaccinated. In Montana, the Blackfeet Nation reports that a majority of its citizens have been vaccinated. And in Alaska, the vaccine was carried to some remote villages by dog sled teams. Some tribes also offered the vaccine to non-natives. The article points out a few, a few key reasons that led to the high rates of vaccinations. One was the message to protect the elders and get vaccinated. The other was credited to Gen Z native youth who posted TikTok videos encouraging everyone to get vaccinated. Those messages were important for Indian country that suffers from health issues, making citizens more susceptible to getting COVID. In fact, when it comes to age group breakdowns, Native Americans are 3.3 times more likely to die of COVID-19 than whites or Asians. That's according to a report by APM Research Lab. Tribal leaders said this success was also due to tribal sovereignty, which gave the tribes the ability to create their own methods of distributing the vaccine. Native American college students across the country are pushing their schools to do more to atone for past wrongs. And this includes the taking and selling of tribal lands to establish the very institutions they attend. Native American alumni of Harvard University say the school is not living up to its 1650 colonial charter. The charter specifically calls for the education of American Indian youth. Samantha Maltais is the 24-year-old daughter of the chairwoman for the Aquina Wampanoag. Maltais will be taking classes at Harvard Law School this fall. She is the first citizen of her tribe to attend the prestigious institution. And she says college charters that called for the education of Indian youth were mainly used as a fundraising tool targeting wealthy Europeans. You know, speaking as somebody who came from Dartmouth College, which is one of those original um, charters that are intended to educate, you know, quote unquote, Indian youth, as well as going into Harvard, it really does represent the original white savior complex and how they were using the intent to assimilate Native students as a fundraising mechanism, mechanism sorry, to to channel the money into these universities in their, in their original charters. The call for colleges to do more comes at a cru critical time. The coronavirus pandemic is increasing challenges for Native students who already have the lowest college graduation rates in the country. It's a court victory for the Colville tribes in a fuel tax lawsuit. The tribe is located in Washington state. A fuel tax is collected on non-tribal members who purchase fuel on the Colville tribal lands. A large portion of the state's fuel tax go back to the Colville to help with road improvements and maintenance. Two convenience store and gas station owners sued the tribe over this practice. They allege the tribe collected this tax unlawfully and claimed they were owed $800,000. However, the tribal court ruled the store owners violated tribal law by refusing to pay and collect the taxes as required. The court is ordering both to immediately begin paying and collecting the proper fuel taxes. Violence in Brazil is increasing as continued friction between illegal gold miners and tribal members threatens to spiral out of control. About 27,000 Gyanomami live on the reserve. Recently, 20,000 miners have made their way by boat into that reserve, and this has led to shootouts between tribal members and illegal miners. 
In one incident, three minors died and five people, including one indigenous person, was injured in an attack on a village. Tribal leader Junior Hekurari Yanomami says the situation is dire in the contested area. This is very revolting. The communities are very scared. The miners are attacking at night. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro plans a visit to the region today, but says he won't intervene to stop gold mining in the region. Treaties that tribes signed centuries ago with the U.S. government are today protecting more than tribes. In several cases, native treaties are now being used to protect the environment and tackle climate change. This includes the fight against Enbridge's Line 3 and Line 5 pipelines that run from Canada into northern Minnesota and Michigan and back to Canada. Now, several indigenous groups are hosting an event called Treaty People Gathering this weekend to oppose the pipeline and to educate the public about the scope and authority of Indian treaties. You can read the full story by Marianette Pember on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. The title is Treaties Offer New Aid in Environmental Fights. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. When we come back, the landmark case of Standing Bear and the school that will soon bear his name. A new school in Lincoln, Nebraska will be named Standing Bear High School. The Board of Education voted unanimously for the name, and it's set to open in 2023. Standing Bear was the leader of the Ponca tribe. He won the landmark case Standing Bear v. Crook in 1879. It recognized that an Indian is a person under the law and entitled to rights and protection. Standing Bear's speech in the courtroom was a defining moment. He said, quote, that hand is not the color of yours, but if I prick it, the blood will flow, and I shall feel pain. The blood is of the same color as yours. God made me, and I am a man. Joining us to share the story of Standing Bear is Larry Wright, Jr., chairman of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. Welcome, Chairman Wright. Thank you for having me. Well, set the stage and give us a little bit of history about uh, Standing Bear and what led to that uh, landmark case. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, it's an, again, it's an honor to be here. In, in our story, the Ponca tribe, uh, the Ponca nation as a whole, uh, back in the late 1800s, uh, after the, the Fort Laramie Treaty, 1868, uh, in, erroneously included our land in, on the Nebraska-South Dakota border. And that we had a treaty at that time, and those acres uh, were, were taken away from us. And so our people were forcibly removed uh, to Oklahoma, and we lost many people along the way, uh, our own Trail of Tears, and, and Standing Bear uh, <clears throat> lost a daughter uh, along the way, and once they got to Oklahoma, uh, his son was dying, and it, one of his, his son's uh, dying wishes uh, to Standing Bear was to, that he wanted to be buried back in the homeland. Uh, his son uh, subsequently died uh, many others were, were, were dying of disease and, and elements and, and, and many things. And Standing Bear and about 30 followers at that time decided that they would rather uh, try to get home and were willing to die to come home in, in large part to honor his son's uh, request and the promise that he made to his son. But also uh, they knew, they believed that if they stayed in Oklahoma, they too could die. Uh, and so they just would rather take the, the chance to come home. Uh, they got as far as our relatives, uh, the, the Omaha tribe, the Omaha tribe. And uh, when they saw the condition our people were in and, and making it that whole journey without being caught, uh, they, they kept them there to try to feed them and, and, and rest up. But about that time, the, the military, U.S. military caught up with Standing Bear with the orders that they'd be turned around and, and marched back to Oklahoma right away. And, and subsequently they were detained down at Fort Omaha at the time. And uh, that's uh, where this 
uh, trial took place through, which nobody knew at the time, but through the generosity and, of General Crook at the time. And the irony was that he was known as one of the, the great Indian fighters at the time. Uh, but uh, he, he saw the condition of our people the, and, and what they've gone through. And it was through his uh, efforts behind the scenes uh, to, to bring this to, to a trial. That in fact, he recommended that Standing Bear sue him uh, to prevent the removal and, and others that uh, worked on our behalf. That is an amazing story. And again, you know, so much of Indian history is not taught in our schools. And um, so uh, having this high school named after Standing Bear really opens up that door to learning more about what happened to you know, your tribe in particular. But again, that story is repeated across the country with so many other tribes. So, um, and then the other idea is that just having to go to court to prove that you're a person. Uh, talk a little bit about that and, and the sentiment of the day when that ruling was made. Well, absolutely, and, and, and really that was the, the bedrock for the case, uh, for the prosecution that Standing Bear didn't have standing in that federal court uh, by the very definition that he wasn't considered a person under the, lie, under the eyes of uh, US law. And so uh, in, in, in coming to that uh, conclusion with, with, with the court, um, the fact that uh, Standing Bear uh, and you know, really the judge, Judge Dundee at the time, uh, referred to a dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, to look up what is a person and, and use that as the definition to say Standing Bear as an Indian meets the definition of a, of a person or a human in this dictionary and therefore in the eyes of United States law. And, and so that's really where that, that came from and, you know, habeas corpus and the fact that Standing Bear wanted to go home and, you know, it was against the law to leave the reservation uh, for Indians. Uh, but the fact that as a person, he would be, and all natives would have protections under the U.S. Constitution and, and U.S. laws. And so being the first native uh, in court, in a federal court like this, was historic at the time. Uh, but for no other reason than our, he and, and those that were with him wanted to go home uh, to our homeland, which we never should have been removed from to begin with. So uh, just to recap again, in 1879, uh, the courts, federal court ruled that Native Americans are actually people. Um, and then we look at this week, and um, this week, June 2nd, marks the anniversary of the Indian Citizenship Act, which actually granted citizenship to all uh, American Indians on, at a federal level, uh, so that we're now citizens of the United States of America. So this kind of history, I think, for a lot of people, a lot of, um, may, you know, is just shocking because they don't understand and know our history. So with this high school opening now, what do you hope for the students who attend and um, first talk about the Native students who will be attending and then the non-Native students. Well, you know, I, I, I think in, in this day and time with, with uh, you know, the last decades of people uh, fighting against the stereotypes of mascots, Indian mascots themselves and, and, and seeing some fundamental shifts with, with the Washington football team removing uh, their name, uh, Cleveland changing uh, their name, and, and others, and, and as we've seen slow change for a brand new high school uh, in 2021 to be named after a, a leader uh, of, a, of a tribal nation and, and to be able to address that issue of being able to honor somebody like Standing Bear who, who deserves to be recognized in, in that way but how do we move forward when, in, in this particular case, it's a public school, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln, Nebraska, I, I believe my numbers may be wrong, but has a student population of about 35,000 students altogether. And so how do you move forward and have this name when people are becoming more and more aware of the negative imagery and that's associated with native mascots? And just because Standing Bear is on the name of the school doesn't mean it has to be a a uh, a mascot issue that's related to him or, or natives in general and we can teach and we can honor the name itself and, and who he was and what 
his experience was and, and what that means for not only our, our Ponca people, but tribal nations across this country and, and people across this country. And so when we move forward, I, I truly believe Lincoln Public Schools, the community has, has a great opportunity to be an example for the country on how these things can go together in a good way and not be derogatory or perpetuate those, uh, those stereotypes that are harmful to, to our youth and, and, and all those all right. Okay, well, and, um, so it, it, we look at what your tribe has been through and then understanding that you just received federal recognition in 1990, it's kind of like, you know, you get this pandemic and you're like, oh, I can deal with that. We've dealt with so much, right? <laughs> um, but what, uh, what, let me tell you what, let me ask, what are the big lessons you've learned from this pandemic? Just how, um, uh, how lucky our people are. And uh, we have great employees that carry out our programs day in and day out. And, you know, what, it, what it's also shown us is that it exacerbated our, our health care system. It exacerbated our, our funding levels, which across the country, in Indian country, those funding levels are not at the level that they should be. We're, we're at less than 50% of what's needed for health care for natives in this country. And trying to respond to a pandemic ahead of any, any assistance coming down to help offset that really taxed our system our health system, but also other other natives uh, in, in other tribes. And we're both in, in an urban setting and in rural setting. And so we saw both both ends of the spectrum for our people in that healthcare system. And when you have a large geography like we do, uh, that compounds that issue. But the historic underfunding of BIA and IHS and Indian country really shone a, a light on this. And, and for our tribe, you know, in 2019, we had uh, flooding in our area. And so we went through a disaster declaration for that. And then a year later to the day, I declared another disaster declaration for COVID. And as we responded, so two years back to back, natural disaster, COVID really has been draining for, for our people. Our, our, our employees have been phenomenal in stepping up and, and doing what was needed to take care of uh, our, our most uh, vulnerable, our elders, and those that are sick, and, and just trying to do whatever was needed and ask to to take care of our people. So it it uh, you know we're no and, different and, in that regard, but yeah. And as you open up with your businesses, uh, what kind of changes are you going to implement? You know, so many people enjoy working from home now. Is that going to be some of the change? You know, some of the tribal casinos reopening are opening up smoke free. Is that going to be a change? Uh, what are some of the changes? Yeah, it, it's definitely a fundamental shift in, in how we do business. And uh, we continue to, uh, I, I, I believe, to be a leader in that. We want to make sure all of our people are safe. Our employees are safe first and foremost. But uh, our clients that come into our facilities for services, they're safe. Uh, and for sure, our customers, uh, that when they come to our casino, uh, we want to make sure that there's no doubt that we're going above and beyond any safety measures that are required by anybody else. Uh, as a sovereign nation, we set that and, and we meet or exceed uh, the others. Um, no smoking in the casino has been, uh, you know, there was some complaints early on, but uh, now people have in, in this year, since it, it, those changes have been implemented, that is most likely gonna become the new norm. Uh, but it's the same with uh, taking extra precautions to make sure we are cleaning things and, and doing that, that extra bit. But when we talk about telecommuting and those things, and, and, and that has been a, a something that we ramped up very quickly. Our tribe has, has used video conferencing for over a decade now because we are so spread out. It's allowed our employees to hold meetings, but in this day and age- So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of carrying on with what you've been doing. Exactly. Yeah. Well. Chairman Larry Wright Jr., thank you so much for joining us today and telling us about the school that's opening up with Standing Bear's name. And we'll follow that story as the, as, as the school uh, is built. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. When we come back, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act is turning 50. We'll get an overview of ANCSA.
It's the 50th anniversary of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which set up a unique way the federal government would deal with Alaska Natives and land management. ANCSA established 13 for-profit Alaska Native Regional Corporations and more than 200 for-profit village corporations. More than 44 million acres of land was divided between the corporations in exchange for the extinguishment of indigenous land claims. Alaska Natives and their descendants are the shareholders for these corporations, leading to a new type of federal policy tied to corporate ownership rather than lands in trust. Today, the corporations provide social services, cultural programs, jobs, and scholarships for the Alaska Native people they serve. But as a piece of legislation that is open to amendments, the Alaska Native corporate, corporate system is still evolving. And as the 50th anniversary for this landmark legislation approaches, Indian Country Today will be examining some of the critical issues and debates surrounding ANCSA. Joining us today is journalist Megan Sullivan, who is overseeing our coverage of ANCSA. Welcome, Megan. Hi. So your first story is kind of setting uh, up the stage of what led to ANCSA and giving context to that. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the first story, um, which will be live on Monday, gives an overview of both the history of ANCSA and the legal details. And we wanted this to be a refresher for our Alaskan audience, as well as an introduction to the concept to our lower 48 audience, um, for people who might not be as familiar with ANCSA and the Alaska Native Corporations. So we really wanted to do a comprehensive piece that tells the whole story of ANCSA and really gets into kind of the history and some of our leaders who helped push forward this legislation, as well as you know what's actually in the act, what are the details and how does this affect people today? So we'll be giving some, some timelines, we'll be giving some mini profiles and uh, providing some definitions just to kind of clear up any confusion before we get into our month long coverage of all the different angles related to ANCSA. Well, it's a very complicated uh, uh, dealing with land rights there. And so after 50 years of ANCSA, and again, it will be celebrated, it turns 50, I think, in December. And so our coverage is leading up to that anniversary date. Uh, what are some of the unexpected results of ANCSA? There are many unexpected results, and it affects many facets of Alaska and Alaska Native life. Um, the second story I'll be working on which will be coming out shortly after the overview story, focuses on ANCSA's impact on Alaska Native identity. So in Alaska, you kind of have a complex layered um, system, many different organizations uh, and entities that Alaska Native people are involved with. So you can be enrolled in your tribe, you can be a shareholder of your regional corporation, and you can be a shareholder of your village corporation or you could be only one of these things. You might be uh, tribally enrolled, but not a shareholder. You might be a shareholder, but not tribally enrolled. And, and some people aren't shareholders or enrolled at all, um, some Alaska Native people. And so the identity story is gonna be kind of investigating the different ways this impacts Alaska Natives today. We're gonna be hearing from a wide range of perspectives, people who've had different experiences with this. Um, and we're really hoping to kind of encapsulate the, the entire experience um, as it pertains to ANCSA. Um, so really excited about that piece. We're, we're hearing from a lot of different people from all over Alaska, as well as Alaska Natives who live in the lower 48. That's the first um, kind of unexpected impact of ANCSA that we'll be exploring. And then for Alaska Natives, subsistence living is a huge uh, uh, issue and priority. So tell us a little bit about that and how ANCSA has impacted subsistence living. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing a large piece on um, ANCSA's impact on subsistence as, as well as several smaller follow-up pieces. So it's definitely a big topic we'll be focusing on. Um, so at its heart, ANCSA was supposed to address indigenous land claims. And as a land claims bill, you would expect this to maybe address subsistence since subsistence, uh, since subsistence is so tied to um, the land. However, at the last minute, subsistence laws were, anything addressing subsistence laws and subsistence legality were taken out of the bill. So this left kind of many questions related to the legality of, of Alaska Native subsistence. There's still a lot of, um, kind of vagueness around this topic. And it's led to some pretty major legal conflicts, I would say, 
where it's just not defined um, and has led to some problems where Alaska Native people have not been permitted to subsistence fish or hunt um, in their ancestral lands. And ANGSA was kind of supposed to protect this right, but it unfortunately left it out. Um, so there's a lot to be done still there. There's a lot of people who are still advocating for the protection of subsistence rights. And people are hoping that in the future, there can be laws added to ANGSA or passed separately that do protect this. So we'll be looking at that issue All right. a lot, yeah. Okay, and we, and we people can read your stories on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. Megan Sullivan, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching. Join us again tomorrow and online at IndianCountryToday.com. Uma umukatsi ukalyani, take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.